Shades of Benga Online presents highlights from the story of Kenya's popular music in the 70-year period between the end of the Second World War and 2016. The series draws its inspiration from the definitive book Shades of Benga by Ketebul Music. Good evening, viewer, and welcome to yet another episode of Shades of Benga Book online series. The book documents the history of Kenyan music from 1946 to 2016. On this episode, we shall be talking about the twist era. And to get us into the discussion is the Nairobi City Ensemble playing Harambe Harambe by Daudi Kabaka. I am your host, Lucy Ilado. panel, we have Dr. Tomo Diambo. Uh, he teaches literature at the University of Nairobi, and he is a critic and writer on arts and culture. Welcome. And next, we have Mr. Tabo Susa. I'm sure you're all well familiar with him by now. He's a music producer and the author of Sheds of Benga. Last but not least is legendary Kenyan broadcaster Elizabeth Omolo. Thank you so much for coming. To start us off on this episode, Mr. Tabu, perhaps you should tell us a little bit more about the twist genre, because we already briefly talked about it on the second episode with Dr. Bettina, but perhaps you can expound on that. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, the twist, as we mentioned uh, during our last episode, is actually the sound of independence. I believe many people of maybe my generation 
who are old enough when we are actually attaining independence, remember the song Harambe, Harambe by Daudi Kabaka. The twist um, also it was used as a unifying song for East Africa. Uh, a good example is a song by, uh, I believe it's John Mwale, I think it's called Af Africa Mashariki, where it uh, was trying to rally people together. I mean, uh, the, 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 the presidents uh, of Kenya, Uganda, and uh, Tanzania. But one thing that is also interesting about Twist, that after every two years, it seems we always have an arrival of interesting musicians. Remember the Congo Connection, where, where the, 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 the Katanga brothers, as you call them, Bosco uh, Jamwenda and um, Edward Masengo. But then, later, just uh, after independence, there was the arrival of other two musicians. Uh, although they were from Zambia, uh, I've, I've been meant to understand that one was actually Congolese, but we, we always call them the, the, the Zambians. And that was uh, Peter Sosi Juma, and uh, a national Pichen Kazembe. So they were actually uh, under the Equator Sound Band of Charles Warrod. And actually, I think they were the real protagonists of Twist. But then, that time, Kabaka and Fadili, they were really inspired by music uh, from uh, the US, Chabi Cheka, you know, and then also the music that this uh, two uh, central uh, Africans brought, uh, the, the, the music that brought along, which, was, which, which actually was uh, uh, based towards the, the Quella music of uh, uh, South Africa and, uh, and Central Africa. So I think that's actually the beginning of Twist, and there were so many of them. Who are some of the um, Twist musicians from Kenya? Most of them were from Kenya. The African twists were all from Kenya. I only say that these Zambians actually played a major role because they were backup artists. But Kabaka was actually known as the king of the African twist. Right now we say Zenze was the last, you know Zenze, but Kabaka was the king. But people like Fabili William started it all. And then of course, uh, later on, John Zenze, there was John Mwale, George Agade, oh, the, 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 the list is so long. I pose the question because I also understand that there were also some musicians from Uganda who are also recording with the Kenyans here. And uh, uh, to follow up on that also, did the sound also move, move into Uganda, Tanzania perhaps? I believe that uh, many people talk about Uganda, the associate twist and Uganda because of two musicians, again, brother and sister. This, uh, the, the bass player, uh, Charles Sonko, actually, who played Harambe Harambe in the, in the Kabaka recording, and the sister, uh, Farida Sonko. So they were really active also in the same group of Equator Sound Band. But whether they took the sound back to Uganda, I really don't know, because uh, the, the main uh, prominence of, uh, the main players of the African twist were from Kenya. To you, um, Elizabeth, uh, during this period, what kind of music was being um, programmed at the, at the Voice of Kenya uh, at that time? If you remember, there was an uh, English service station, and all the music we played was foreign. We were not allowed to play African music at that time. They were all um, Europeans. I was the first African to uh, start broadcasting with the Wazungus in that station. So uh, definitely I got into English music and I went on with English music where we played a lot of classical then. We had uh, one hour of classical music on, on Thursday evening with Natkovsky. We played a lot of rhythm and blues. Uh, we had the oldies from Perry Como, from uh, Louis Armstrong. I loved so much, named my son after Louis Armstrong. 
Uh, then we had a lot of um, country music. We are for now still playing and lovely uh, songs like those from Kenny Rogers, Don Williams, Charlie Pride, uh, Crystal Gale. We had ballet. There was a lady that was playing the ballet music on the station. We had uh, another lady doing opera. We had a lot of instrumentals also, because we had five main programs at that time. We had, first program was Breakfast Club with uh, Mzungu, then there was lunchtime music. We had beat time, that's where you would play all the pop music. Then we had Sundowner, which is still playing up to now. Very loving, um, very lovable music. Then we had Late Date, where all the young souls had to wait. And um, that's why people still love to listen to Sundowner on KBC English Service. Actually, you're very right. It's a very, it's, I think it's one of the popular programs from KBC. Um, just allow me to ask you this. Do you mind... Um telling us how you got into broadcasting. And you mentioned that you were the first African uh, uh, female uh, to work uh, alongside the, the, the white people. So how was the experience like for you? To have it Africanized, it was, I mean, I wasn't very comfortable at first because they looked at me like, where am I coming from? What right did I have to go uh, and work with them? But as I was sent for a voice test, uh, first time, then they said I come back after two weeks. I went after two weeks, they said, okay, we can train you. So I said, I wasn't sure what I really wanted to do. But after the second meeting with them, the training started and it was six good months of sitting with the Muzungu in the studio. You are not talking, you're just watching what they are doing. You're not allowed to talk or to touch. Even the, <laughs> the LPs, the record, the music playing, I wasn't allowed to touch whatsoever. So I was given a special seat there. I watch everything from uh, morning till evening every day for six good months. And the first day they sent me to the studio, I was alone. I was given an LP to put on. It was classical music, to play at 33 speed, <laughs> I put 45, didn't it, and I ran to the office and said, there's no music, it's quiet, I said, what did you do? That thing should have lasted 30 minutes. So I played the LP at the wrong speed. That's <laughs> how I started. Thereafter, I made mistakes, but I learned from those mistakes, and I got so involved I loved my job, and I, I enjoyed music more than any other program. Then I started doing the Hello Children, which also gave me a name, Auntie Elizabeth. I did Hello Children for almost 20 years of Hello Children. That involved going to schools, talking to the kids, bringing them to the studio, talking to them, singing with them, dancing with them, playing their own music, having them sing for you, singing, uh, hearing their own voices, and that was enjoyable. Right now we have a lot of uh, platforms like Spotify, you know, Apple Music, where you can download music. How, how are you able to get, um, to get access to the international music that you are playing? It wasn't difficult. They had a way of getting their music. Um, they used to listen a lot to foreign stations. And they had music producers like uh, 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 Mike Andrews. They had a way of listening and knowing what is playing abroad and what is popular in foreign stations. Because then it was only KBC playing, KBC radio. So it was a monopoly. We were the only ones people were listening to. So we were listening to foreign stations and they, if they hear something good, they order for it and they just bring it to the studio. And then the um, uh, local artists, when they had new songs, they just used to bring a copy to the studio. They used to bring like five copies to the record library. So the presenters had access to those new songs that have been produced locally and 
abroad. Uh, Dr. Tom, um, during this period, it's the same time that the Africanization policy was taking um, effect. So could you perhaps tell us a little bit more about that? And uh, furthermore, how did that have any effect in the arts uh, and culture scene? Yeah, yeah I mean, I mean uh, um, Aunt Liz did not say exactly uh, when she walked into the studio. Probably, uh, when did you, do you remember the day when you actually <laughs> walked into the studio? It was December 1970. Wow. Uh, December 1970 is almost um, seven years since the beginning of the Africanization uh, 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 project mm -hmm. nationally. Uh -huh. So you can imagine that until Liz is uh, becoming part of the, the four soldiers of Africanization that late, because Africanization begins in 1964. Mm -hmm immediately after independence. It makes a lot of sense that, um, that uh, only Mzungus could go to certain pubs, uh, only Mzungus could go to certain clubs. Uh, so by 1964, all these uh, Africans who are in politics, uh, civil servants, who are getting into the corporate sector, they also want these good things. So a policy is generated. And um, recently, I get to know that Tom Boyer was actually at the root of it. You can imagine Tom Boyer was, was as worldly as anybody else. So he was very offended that uh, uh, this is an African country and Africans are still in the background. So the policy um, uh, between 1964 and 1967 uh, seeks to try and make sure that certain businesses um, can only be done by Africans. Uh, you can only do particular businesses if you're an African. So the Mzungus has to sell to an African or actually become a silent shareholder to an African. Uh, if you are a Goan, an Indian, if you are non-African, you have to get out of some businesses and get out of some regions, uh, especially the countryside. So you can imagine that blacks now have money in their pockets. They are going to consume culture. Uh, and I'm very sure Auntie Liz will tell us a little bit later about clubs. Uh, where were they clubbing? Who was clubbing there? What was going on? Um, um, and so it's not just the transference of businesses, but money gets into pockets. And if money gets into the pockets, it can't just sit there. It has to be sent. So you would see a growth in the production of music that suits the African test. You would see a growth in the studios or the producers inviting in more African singers. And that would cut across uh, from music uh, to sports, um, to theater, uh, to uh, uh, film production. You would see a lot more Africans in, those, in films, especially after the 1970s, because if the program is set up, the African, it's called Africanization Program, but it was actually a Kenyanization program. It was very strict. You had to be a Kenyan. And it didn't just happen here. It was there in Tanzania as well. The Ugandans were- But it failed in Uganda, no? Uh, well, I mean, the Ugandans were always never so sure about why you should talk too much about Africans because they were not really colonized. Uh, they were a small kind of a protectorate, right? They were never colonized. So for us, uh, this is the moment, actually, if you think about it, the highlight of Kenyan cultural production is in the 70s because these are the benefits of the Kenyanization program and it starts to go down in the 80s. So it, it starts to rise in the late 60s, it matures in the 70s, and that's how uh, Tab will tell you a lot of Zairean musicians, including Tanzanian musicians now claiming to be Zairians, coming into the country because at that time you could freely actually drink some drinks in Nairobi, but not in Dar es Salaam. So people used to fly from Dar es Salaam to come take vodka here. And now let's hear some more music by the Nairobi City Ensemble playing Angelique Twist by John Zenze.
Tabu, would you like to add on to that? Yeah, sure. Uh, what Dr. Uh, Diambo was saying is quite right. The, the, the 1970s was, was about the best time when it, came, when it came to music in this country. And of course, uh, he also correctly said that uh, that that also the time when so many uh, Congolese groups uh, arrived here. So definitely it was the, the, the right time. Maybe something we, we, we need to talk about is uh, the music that you played on, on, on radio. Do you not actually reflect the same music sound that was heard in, uh, in the clubs? Radio English service had a separate audience. Okay. And that was their station. And they wouldn't want any other music on that station. So it was all English and it was separate and it had a clientele. <clears throat> when, when you were playing like on the English service, was it uh, was your choice out of a genre or, or, or language? Because suppose someone sang in Kiswahili and the genre was R&B, would you play it? Yes. But I mean, you're also talking about a social class because you are talking about, she said something interesting about who is listening. Right. Who has the ability to buy the radio, buy the battery, spare the time to listen. In a lot of the, 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 the countryside, even in, this, in the poor neighborhoods in this town, you are using kerosene, so you go to... To, in the rural sleeping. areas, they had communal radios, radios. Yes. and TVs. So they would go to that hall. They used to have halls. And then mobile cinema vans that used to go from one, one uh, town to another. Wow. So those mobile stations and uh, community radios and, and, and TVs, that's where they used to get us. And uh, then we had the broadcast to schools, which was in English, a lot in English, then with James Tonyango Joel. And uh, we were having uh, the only station. So all schools, primary schools, secondary schools were listening to us. So that is another one from, uh, that uh, got airtime from Ministry of Education. So that is when now, again, uh, uh, culture started coming in, our uh, love for foreign music started coming in because of the programs that are coming out in English. What, what, what the uh, bigger uh, audience between the general service and the national service? The national service, of course, had a larger audience. So like if your music was being played on the national service, you'd reach out, uh, you'd, you'd reach a wider audience? Of course, uh, 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 talented local artists they would have their song first aired through national service because they know almost everybody is listening to the Kiswahili service 
During the previous episode, we signed out with the Malaika song by Fadili Williams, and we um, there's this discussion happening. Of course, it's been happening for many years. Uh, it's called the Malaika controversy. So um, maybe would you clarify who was the original author of the song, and maybe we under we know that there are some other musicians from across the continent that also did various renditions of the of the of the, of the song. Well, the story of Malaika is, uh, <clears throat> is interesting, but I don't think it's such a big controversy as people want to make of it. Because um, from the records, Malaika was the first version of Malaika was recorded in 1960 by Grant Charo on lead vocals and uh, Fadili William on supporting vocals and Fundikonde was the, the, the sound guy. But unfortunately, Grand Charo, who was actually not uh, really a professional musician because he used, I think, to work with BAT. So he died in 1962. So when um, Charles Ward acquired the catalog from Jumbo Records, which was being run by, by uh, Peter Colmo, uh, uh, Ward recorded the song. And, and I've told you that already Grand Charo had died. From a, from a tragic road accident. So the problem, I think, is when Charles Warrod re-recorded the song, he omitted the name of uh, the original composer, or, not, or one of the composers. Because you see, as many musicians will tell you uh, during our t time, uh, song structure was uh, sometimes uh, an, uh, I mean, uh, a communal effort. Yeah. You might come with a theme, then somebody comes with the arrangements of the song, additional lyrics. So I believe it was a, a, a joint uh, work of Grand Charo first and Fadili William. So it is, it is their, their songs, the two of them, with the Grand Charo first and Fadili second. Because, you know, it, it's always the first, like I call myself the lead author, yeah. but I'm not the only author here in this book here. So I think the lead composer was Grant Charo, and then Fadili William. About anybody else saying that he came from Tanzania, those are just stories because we have to go by records. This, I've not had any record that uh, Malaika that was recorded before 1960. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Tom, do you have anything to add on that? I mean, the reason the controversy works well, it's a marketing tool. I mean, if, 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 I, if, 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 if I told you today that uh, Tabu is migrating to Tanzania next week, eh? you will spend the entire evening wanting to find out why. And that's productive for somebody. So the controversy over Malaika, the fact that it has been reproduced, there's so many versions of it. The fact that probably nobody knows where the royalties from all those versions go and attribution, etc., is uh, it's good for so many people. The, but the big question that comes from that, and which goes back to the Africanization, Kenyanization question, is what have we done as a country to claim it uh, as a centerpiece of uh, our musical production? Just going back to Malaika briefly, uh, I've got a lot of respect for Miriam Makeba, Mama Africa. Yeah, but you see, uh, when you, in, on... Uh, on, on one of her, on her recordings of Malaika, she introduces the song as coming from Tanzania. And I don't know why, what gave her that idea, really. So that, that, that's the thing I think Dr. Diambo was saying, that the, the Kenyan government should have claimed that I mean, immediately. They shouldn't have let it just go like that. So, and that's why I see right now, even it gave the Tanzanians an idea the, the idea that that song could be there was, 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 was from Tanzania. Yeah, but um, we, we, I think, uh, I appreciate our original African uh, artists, especially Kenyan artists, the ones that started earlier on did a good job. They were not in a hurry. They took time to check on their lyrics. And they took time to go to the studios for final recording. So that when it came out, they were free and, and very confident that this song will hit. So that when they bring them to the studios, they saw the songs people dancing to. 
and you go to the jukeboxes and to the clubs, they are listening to their songs, they are seeing people enjoying their songs. So those who started in Kenya, they did a good job. Compared to the current composers, who I think should take time, uh, listen to their voices to begin with, uh, check their lyrics, lyrics, lyrics. Because then it comes to our studios, we say, unfit for broadcast. <laughs> so they take time, they took time, and they did a good job. The current composers, some are not ready to take time. They are not patient enough. Look at the, the, the corona issue. Within a week when corona hit Kenya, somebody had already produced a song. It was out. So I said they're always in a hurry to uh, bring these songs out. And later on, they want to kind of improve on it which tells us that they didn't really take their time to listen and to go through it. And then like it could take you three to four months, even six months trying to compose a song and be ready with all the voices you need, with all the instruments you need so that it comes out something decent, something that will stay, not something which will be popular for just six months and then it's gone under, which is happening right now. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen and lady, for coming. Um, thank you so much for taking your time as well. Tabu, it's always a pleasure to have you. Um, Auntie Liz, that's your new nickname. No, that's <laughs> thank you so name. much. Yes. Um, you're an inspiration to a lot of young women, I believe, out there. People like me who are young in media, I think it's very, uh, in, um, it's, it's an honor to be able to listen to you and sit with you in one room and, 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 and get to hear all this um, wisdom that you have to share. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. <laughs> thank you, viewer, for being with us. To play us out is the Nairobi City Ensemble performing Helule Helule by Daudi Kabaka. I have been your host, Lucy Ilado. Helule, lule, ya baba. Helule, nyolanga itabu. Helule, lule, ya baba. Helule, nyolanga itabu.
Ici et la cora. Elule, elule, ababa. Elule, ici et la cora. Elule, elule, ababa. Elule, ici et la cora. The journey through Shades of Benga continues. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on our social media platforms for the next episodes. Shades of Benga, the book, is available in all leading bookstores in Kenya. Get your copy for this and other stories in full. Mambo Vipi, Mambo Vipi.